Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. And uh, welcome to our Sabbath day sacrament prayer and bits and bobs. So I'm going to ask Carl to say an opening prayer. So if you'd like to bow or kneel with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank thee so much for this day to be with Brother Michael in his home. I ask that you bestow your blessings upon all your brothers and sisters and upon all your children, regardless of who they are, where they are, or what they are. We are facing difficult times and with threats of violence and other things, but I know that if we cling to our faith and stick to it and have our belief in our Lord and Saviour, that all these things will come to pass. And I say that in his most holy and sacred name. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah, so it's a happy Sabbath here. Nice sunny day. But it's a bit cold. And I uh, uh, hope you've got your emblems ready. Because I'm about to read uh, the, the blessing on the bread. Okay. So. At this time, we welcome our present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. If you'd like to bow or kneel, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kneel. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O oh God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of Thy Son, and always remember Him, and keep His commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. Carl is now going to bless the, uh, the bread. I mean, the, the wine. wine. Yes. Sorry. If you would bow your heads, brothers and sisters, kneel or any comfortable position you may feel comfortable in. I will now bless the wine. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of Thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. Shalom, brothers and sisters. I wanted to share a message with you today based on universalism. And I, I was praying on this, and the scripture, that, there's two scriptures that came to mind, actually. And I'm going to paraphrase them. The two scriptures that came to my mind on this topic are, one, where Jesus says that not everyone that serves him is, is going to be going to heaven, basically. There are some people that are going to go to him, and, he, and he's going to cast them out. They're going to say, but, but Lord... I spent my whole life dedicated to you. I spent my whole life serving you. And you'll say, no, you didn't really serve me. You know, you're be gone. That does not seem very universalist. 
And then the other one is, if in the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Alma, where Amulek is on trial and the, the lawyer Zezrum, Zezrum, basically he tries to trip him up, Amulek up in his words, and he says, is, he asks him, is God going to save people in their sins? And Amulek says, no. And so then Zezrum says, so I want to clarify here what this guy's just saying now. He's telling you that there is only one God, but this God has a son. And then this guy, this, this son isn't going to save everyone as if he has the power to tell God what to do. And then, you know, Amulet goes off and says, you, you're, you're, you're a liar. You're trying to deceive these people. That's not what I said at all. And he clarifies and says that God's going to save us from our sins and not in them. Now, there's two ways that we can look at these words. One of them is to say, we have to perfect ourselves. We have to become perfect before God will save us. As long as we're in any sort of sin, we, we are not worthy of heaven. We're damned to hell. We're, we're not going to make it. And that's very obviously an anti-universalist message, right? But it's also anti New Testament because the New Testament says John 3:17 that Jesus has come to offer us salvation to save us and not to condemn us and obviously I'm paraphrasing here and there are other scriptures that talk about this idea you know doctrine and covenant 76 which is doctrine of saints 42 of people being able to go to heaven who you know like basically nearly everybody so how do we how do we reconcile these things what if when he says that what he's saying is god isn't going to say go out and sin and and i'm going to love you and i'm going to save you in that sin but instead he's going to save us from our sins by taking the, us out of them through the grace of jesus christ another anti-universalist scripture from the local mormon is in nephi second nephi it's where Nephi says, you know, in the last days, people are going to say, eat, drink, and be merry. And, and the reality is that that's something that's been said for quite some time. I don't think, I think it's always been said, not just in the last days, you know, or, or go and do a couple of sins. You're fine. You know, everybody's going to be saved. And no, no, no. Now's the time. You got to, you got to find your place now today and repent. That sense of urgency is throughout the Book of Mormon that this is the life. Well, one of the things that I, I don't know if this is true or not, but one of the things that was supposedly taught in secret during Joseph Smith's time and was definitely taught a little bit in Brigham Young's time in, in that particular sect is this idea of reincarnation or multiple mortal probations. I, I don't know why people have to change the name. I think that's kind of weird. Like, just call it re reincarnation. We, we don't need a new name for this. We're not really inventing the wheel here, guys. But can that be true if this is the life? If this is the time, now is when we're supposed to to come to Christ. And yet, there are people in the Latter-day Saint movement who very much believe in reincarnation. I will say I am probably not one of them. But I, my saying on reincarnation is, if I die and it turns out it's true, then I guess I don't really have a choice. Does it matter if I believe in it or not? But the reason why I say it doesn't matter is because the Book of Mormon says, that this life now is the one that counts. This life now is the one that matters. I don't want to have to come back again if, if reincarnation is real. I, I don't really want that. And so if it is real, hopefully I can get everything taken care of now and be done with it. My point though, I'm not trying to get into reincarnation. My point is that there are a lot of things in a lot of the same movement that if we just want to cherry pick the scriptures and nitpick that we can find problems with. What I think we really have to do is find solutions. Because anti-universalism, in my mind, exists for one reason and one reason only, and that's to control people. Or for a small group of people to tell a larger group of people that if you don't do what, what they tell you, then you're going to hell and you'll be there forever. And because God's the eternal God, hell is the eternal place, and, and, and therefore you will be stuck there for forever and ever and ever because this one bad thing that you did. I don't know, that just doesn't make sense to me. There's a scripture in Doctrines and Covenants that says that no one has said that hell, that you know, damnation is, is eternal. Hell is eternal, but is damnation eternal? 
And then it goes on to kind of talk about that more. And it's honestly very confusing. By the time you're done, you're like, so is it or isn't it? I don't know. And I feel like the vision, DNC 76, Doctrine and Saints 42, that is the key to answering the question that was asked in the prior revelation. The prior revelation, by the way, I believe is in the book of Avar for fellowship scriptures. So how, how do we, how do we move past these, these obstacles, if you will? I mean, even in our, in our bylaws, in the question, the very last question is, you know, are you willing to endure to the end? Are you willing to do your best to obey the commandments? How, how can we ask that and still be universal if we're all just magically going to be saved? Well, I want to go back to why Jesus is going to tell certain people, you know, get thee behind me. I'm going, to, I'm going to cast you out even though you say you follow me. It all gets down to the intent of our hearts. And that is what Jesus saves us from. In our sins means that my intent is my egoism. I am doing this for my own pride and my own selfishness. I want to give you an example. Let's say that you're a young couple getting married. And you are madly in love with your significant other. I mean, you love them. You'll do anything for them. You've always said, you know, I'll, I'll never try this food. But your new spouse says, hey, I just made this thing that I know you don't like. I wanted to try it. Will you try it with me? And you're like, yes, I will. I will try it with you. I'll do that. I love you so much. I will do that. There's an activity that you absolutely despise doing. You've always hated it, but it's their favorite. So you go and you watch, even though you don't like it, because you just want to be with them and you want to support them where they are, support the thing that they love. You're willing to go out of your way and out of your comfort zone for that person. Well, then you one day, you want to go out to eat and there's a restaurant that serves all kinds of food, but they have one particular food in, in that, that your significant other doesn't like. But everything else there is great, and it's your favorite restaurant, and you've always wanted to try, you know, to, to take your, your significant other there and enjoy it. And you say, hey, you know, we're finally in an area that has this restaurant. Can, can we go try it? And they say, oh, they have this one plate that I don't like, so we're not gonna go. Now suddenly, you know, what is it, uh, quid pro quo? I've been doing all this stuff for you and you can't just go eat at a restaurant that has all kinds of food, but it's the one thing that you don't like. And then all of a sudden you, you look back and you realize you're doing all these things for your significant other and you're sacrificing so much of yourself, but they're not doing the same for you. They're not willing to put aside the things that they don't like for you. And then you realize that not only that, but they're going out behind your back to do things without you, with other, with other people. They have someone else. Let's we'll say they're having an affair. Now suddenly your heart is broken and you realize that this person that you were giving so much to was doing nothing more than taking. What do you do? Now that you've seen the intent of their heart, you have to make a choice. And the problem is that you still, you still love them. As human beings in this kind of situation, the problem is that we generally have two reactions and there can be other reactions obviously, but in general, there are two reactions that happen. One is we become severely depressed and obsessive and we start asking ourselves, how can we make this person love me? How can we change this person so that they love me the way that I love them? And the answer is that you can't because the intent of their heart is the intent of their heart. The other reaction is that that love twists and becomes hate and you cast them aside. You want them gone. You never want to see them again. You're betrayed. You're hurt. You feel like a fool. You've sacrificed so much and for what? For nothing. 
I believe that God is beyond this, this type of petty humanness, human pettiness. Either way, that God still has to say, you're not ready yet. I need you to step to the side and look at what you've done and look at who you are. So let's imagine this situation again. How do we, we react the way that God would? I am still in love with you, but I'm not going to smother you with that love. I'm going to step aside and let you do what you need to do in your life. I want you to know that I love you and I'm here for you. But that I can't be there for you the way that you want because I don't worship you. I want this to be a mutual relationship where we work together. And then you step aside and you live your life. And then this person now has to say, do I, do I really love my significant other? Do I really want to be with this person? Do I really want to show the same kind of dedication to them that they have to me? And if the answer is yes, then they get back together and they have the most amazing marriage. So when God says that he has to set people to the side, he has to cast them aside, he has to cast them out. He's not going to save them in their sins. What he's doing is offering his grace to them. He's not saying you're not welcome here. He's saying you're not ready yet. And I know that there are people who are going to say, well, what's the difference between this and the church that I was in that said that I have to leave because I can't, or I can't enter their temple because I can't answer, answer their temple recommend questions. That's very simple. The difference between, in this example here, recommend questions. And what God is trying to do is, with recommend questions, you have a checklist. Are you doing this? Are you not doing that? All right, well, you, you pass. This looks good. Or, oh, you have one little slight error. Grace isn't good enough for you. Sorry, mm, not going to make it. God doesn't have a checklist like that. What God's looking for is the intent in your heart. The questions that the Lord gave me for the fellowship, none of them ask you what your sins are. What horrible things have you done? Are you willing to stop doing these terrible things and admit to everybody that they're awful? Are you aligning yourself with people that we don't like? All the questions the Lord gave us to ask you are personal questions that only you can answer based on the intent of your heart. Where is your heart? Justice has been served in the grace of Jesus Christ. And through that grace, we will be saved from our sins and not in them. This is the day. Now is the time to come to Christ, not tomorrow. And yet tomorrow, you will hear me say that again. And the day after that, you'll hear me say that again. Because God wants you to come now every now from the very beginning until you finally accept he wants you to come now because the sooner you come the more light there is to shine on the world and help heal this creation is that a universalist message yes because again the door is always open God's never going to tell you to go and frolic and have fun and do whatever you want. And he's also never going to tell you, be miserable and only do what I want. What God's going to ask you to do is to look at yourself and why you're doing what you're doing. And he's going to say, I've done everything for you. I've died for you. I've come back for the dead for you. Will you accept that? 
Will that be enough? So my message for you today is learn to love yourself, the Lord, and your neighbors. If we can do this, we will build Zion. That's my message for you this week, and I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that concludes our our sacrament service for today. But um, uh, as Kyle was saying earlier on about, I think we're living in the times of revelation. Do you, Kyle, as well? Yes. And I'd like to ask my brothers and sisters to go to the book of Revelation and study as much as you can. We are in very violent times at the moment, and there's no doubt about it, war is looming, because the world is in such a abysmal state with petty squabbles, petty hatreds, and just absolute mindless violence. But I know, as same as Brother Michael knows, that if we stick to our faith and keep our belief in our Saviour Jesus Christ, all will be well. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, Carl. So, yeah, we got lots of stuff going on with the fellowship. Uh, David's doing studies of the Book of Mormon, and I'm doing readings of the the Chronicles of the Children of Aranak. We're on the Book of Jaranak at the moment, We're starting the first chapter this week. Also, we got prayer meeting on Thursday night. And uh, we were talking about uh, lessons that they have with the fellowship. But we can't join them in England because they're about 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm. So me and Mark were on about, I'd said, I can get on the page for the School of Prophets and uh, we can do take the teachings from there. So the first one's about, well, first one's baptism, and the next one is about how your faith works. So we'll have a look at that. I'll probably do a live video or something for that. We'll try that later on. Uh, yep, so going to finish up with a prayer, and uh, have a good week. So, Al Shadi, Heavenly Father, we thank you that your spirit is with us. We thank you for this time that we can recharge our faith and batteries by taking the sacrament. And uh, we thank you for this wonderful gift of the sacrament. It's a big part of the church. And uh, it helps us renew our covenant with God. So we thank you for that. And we thank you for all, everybody all over the world, our brothers and sisters that are in pain at the moment, or brothers and sisters living through war. We pray that you will help them, Lord, and we pray for governments that they will humble their heart and that there be not too much greed in the world like there is now. So we pray for your return, uh, uh, Jesus' return, and we look forward to that day. And uh, I say these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. Yeah, Shabbat Shalom. I'm showing you in my shirt. <laughs>